So good afternoon, everyone. Today we are going to talk about Combash Alpha, which is actually a mathematical equation of calculating internal consistency among an experiment. So just to go through the formal uh, definition first, Combash Alpha is a measure of internal consistency. That is how closely related a set of items are as a group. So if you're actually not from the social science background, Combash Alpha actually means the um, precision of the data. So if you are really um, familiar with the word precision accuracy. Precision actually means that how closely do you hit the target? Uh, no, how closely are your uh, experiment are to each other? So we have three situations here. One is all in the middle, one is all in the side, and one is in, all in the side here. So all three of them are very precise. They always measure the same thing every single time. So this also the idea that if you have a length and you have a ruler, do you, do you always get the same length all the time? That's all your banana... It's so always 15 cm, it's always 15 cm, okay? Something like that. So my video cuts out, okay, I'm back. So in that, in that case, the, the equations actually has been slightly transformed across the years but upon the publication of this equation in 1951. So this is the current equation where alpha is equals to n times c's bar divided by p, ps, uh, v times n minus 1 c. So I'm not going to really talk about equations because I'm, I think the original equation is a lot easier to understand. Of course, I'm here to talk about the, the understanding of the equation, not how you actually, you know, just put in the equation larger than 0 0.7, that's good enough, okay? So I'm going to go through step by step on how this equation is formulated and what does it mean and what, how would your alpha change upon the changes of each uh, parameter within your experiment. So commercial alpha is used a lot in surveys, I believe. So it's how you can able to tell that your survey question, so what we also call dimensions of it, uh, is correct, and how does every single question collect the same number of consistency within your sample group, and so on and so forth like that. So the original equation, which is uh, which this new equation form is derived from is actually something like this. So alpha is equal to n divided by n minus 1 times 1 minus uh, sum of vi divided by vt. So in this case, vi is the variance in between a sample, which is in the, your one of the question. So the sample within the question and vt is the sum of the total variance, which we're going to go through it a little bit more detail later in the second page over here. Okay, so n is the number of items, variance of total score and variance of uh, variance of the summation of the total score, so something wrong with summation of the total score, okay? So as long as your alpha is 0 0.7, higher is better. So if you just want to run it as CSS, uh, this is not a video for you, you can just go and I'll just recommend you to some other video in the description below. So the first thing that we need to know when we are dealing with an equation like that is how we calculate n. So n is the number of items. In this case, it's the number of questions you have in a survey. So if your survey has 25 questions, that will mean 25 different items. So unless you use triangulation, where you have to do some processing before the n is calculated. So in the simple ten, in simplest terms, uh, you just have to plug in how many survey questions you have. If it's 25, it's 25. Easy, okay? So next one is to calculate the sum of vi, which is slightly more complicated. So I have a very short example of a three equations over here. So the first equation, the first question, sorry, not equation, the first question here has a mean of 1, a variance of 0 0.3. If you don't know how to calculate variance, it's actually just the, the cube of the standard deviation. So variance and standard deviation are the same thing that, that can be derived from one another. So it's just measure how much is the spread among the sample. So in this case, your yeah, standard deviation is the square root of variance in this case. So this is question number one. Question number two, you have a mean of three, a variance of 0 0.1, and question number three, you have a mean of 1.2 and a variance of 0 0.03. In this case, question three has the smallest amount of variance, while sample one has the largest amount of variance uh, with comparison to the mean, but that's not. Okay, so just let you have an understanding of how spread out the data is based on the variance state value. So the sum of VI here is sum of um, variance of each item. So it's VI1 plus VI2 plus VI3. In this case, it's 0 0.3 plus 0 0.1 divided by 0 0.03 and however much question number that you have. So in this case, uh, the sum of VI will be 0 0.43, I believe, yes. The sum of VI is, will be 0 0.43. So once we get N, we get N sum of VI, let's go to VT. So VT is a little bit more simple, I'll say. So let's just move it in the middle so you can see, okay? So in this case, how to calculate VT is that we sum up 
all of the items and we get the variance of total. So in this case, uh, from question one, we have three person understand, answering each question. So person one answer zero, person two answer two, person three answer one. Okay, so that's question one, question two, same thing, three, six, zero, question three, one point two, two point four, four. Of course, the variance is wrong because, you know, it's, it's not the same question. You know, I'm just using an example of it. Okay, so the, the variance of total is that we calculate the variance of, we calculate the total of question one, which is 4.2. Uh, we calculate the total of question two, which is 10.4. And we calculate the total of question three. So we get Question 1, 4.2, and question 2, 10.4, and we get question 3, which is 1. So you get the variance between these three items and how many items that you have in your experiment. So in this case, we get 15.26, okay? So that's a very large number comparison because our data, as you can see here, is very, very spread out. Okay, so once you know how the calculation, let's plug them into an equation, let's see what happened. So in this case, we used the original convex equation developed by Combatchley in 1951. So how we can actually visualize and understand equation is to use what we call a, a limit. So we imagine a number to be really big and we imagine the number to be really small and we try to visualize the situation when the number is big versus when it's small. Okay, in this case, if so we first of all, we deal with the easiest number, which is n, the number of items you have in your survey question. So if we visualize two different situations, n is equal to 1,000, which is a big number, and n is equal to 2, which is a small number. So imagine you give out 1,000 question survey, and another survey you only give out two questions. So if you plug into a number, we just have to change this part. Uh, 1,000 divided by 999, which is about one point something. So we just generalize it to one because the larger the n is, the closer this whole item will be closer to one. Okay, so in this case, one times this one. And if n equals to two, two divided by one equals to two. So in this case, you can already see that uh, this is going to be much larger than this if the, the back equation doesn't change. So it means that if you have a larger number of questions in your survey, uh, most likely your reliability is not going to be as high because uh, obviously you have more items within your survey. And there's more higher chance that you are not having a very good uh, consistency among your data because there's more things to run, there's more... Uh, there's more parameter that the equation need to run through and there's more likely that you'll be unreliable. And of course, it also determines uh, on the variance in the back. But the, the, the trick to increase reliability is the first thing, lower the number of questions that you have. So that's one of the things that you can do. So as you can see, I wrote here, alpha favors a small sample size. So a small sample size usually have a larger alpha. So let's go to, we do the same thing with the second term over here, which is sum of VI. So the sum of variance of each item. Let's see, we use the same thing, 1002, and we assume N is a large number because it's easier to calculate that way. Because anyway, N will not be affected as long as they're the same. And yeah, I got a little bit confused here. That's why you can see there's a little bit of over here. So let's go through the first item where VI sum is equals to uh, alpha, uh, equals to 1000. So you can see 1 times 1 minus 1000 divided by VT. So with VT doesn't change, the larger the number here, if you have 1 minus a large number, you get a small number. Make sense? So 1 minus large number, you get a small number. That's why alpha here will be smaller than here. Okay, so you, if your sum of variance is low, you have a larger alpha. Make sense? This is smaller, this is bigger, bigger is better. So this one is better than this one. Okay, so having a small number of uh, variance in between the item, which kind of is common sense, I believe. <laughs> so if you have a small number of variance in between your item number, you get a larger alpha. Make sense? So make sure that uh, all the questions have a very, very consistency, fit, consistent feedback amount among your sample. So the, for the third one, let's say the VT. So that's the variance of the total sum, uh, variance of the total, variance of the sum total. Okay, so we have 1002. So we plug the same thing in the equation, assuming n is about a very large number again. So you can one times this, one times one minus this over 1000 and one times this over, divide by two. So assuming that VI doesn't change, 
and this will have a much smaller number. So one minus a much smaller number means this is a bigger number. So this is a bigger number over this one, assuming all other remain unchanged. Which of course, uh, if you have a larger VI, usually have a larger v, VT as well. So we, we're just going to ignore that and try to understand the equation and how it works first. Okay, so in this case, if you have a large number of VT, you actually have a larger number of alpha. So they're having a total variance that is big uh, relative to a small VI means that your sample is more consistent, meaning that you have designed enough dimensionality so you can separate out your... Uh, reliability into different groups. So uh, every single group has to be reliable, but intergroup, uh, we don't really consider that because they are, they are different dimension to begin with. So make sure that your variance between each uh, is more, variance between each of the question is more, but a variance total be large. So in that case, you have a very big ratio and a very good um, alpha, which means that your sample is very consistent. So let's just have a very short summary of what I have talked about the last 10, 20 minutes, I'm not sure. So in this case, alpha is equals to n divided by n minus one, n times one divided by some of the vi divided by vt. Okay, so let's look at the first one. So if you want alpha to be high, you need n to be small. Okay, so the smaller number of n, the larger the alpha. Assume everything remains unchanged. And if you want a larger alpha, you need a higher vi, Sorry, I think a small VI and a large VT. I think I make a mistake over here. So I will just block it so you cannot look at it. Okay, so, so I'll repeat this again. So you need a large alpha. You need a small item size, which is N. A small VI, so a small sum of VI, just to clarify here. And you need a large VT. So in this case, you can actually get a large alpha, which according to most literature, larger than 0 0.7 is really considered good enough. So that's basic compact alpha and is used a lot in surveys to determine the reliability test of the result. So I thanks for watching. Breakfast for a living.